Hey guys, before we start the show, I just want to give a quick shout out to another podcast. Go check out Pacific War Podcast, week by week. Hosted by yours truly, Craig Watson, in association with Kings and Generals. Found on all podcast platforms, like Spotify. Give it a click. You'll like it. You are listening to the Pacific War Channel's podcast. If you wish to see the video version of these podcasts, go to the Pacific War Channel on YouTube. Hello, welcome back to the Pacific War Podcast. I am joined here by my friend Eric, who you might have seen in uh, previous episodes. We did one on Midway once. Hello, everyone. And this is actually going to be, um, I guess we can call it a pilot. It's going to be a new, not series, but maybe a new future for this podcast. I am simply inviting people I know within the history world, or maybe even outside it, and we are going to just do podcasts based on a, a very popular subject. Today's podcast is going to be on the most popular subject that I have received from many fans of the Cheers, Kings and Generals Discord community who pelted me with three questions in particular. But the first one has been, what if Japan had attacked the Soviet Union during World War II, most likely during uh, Operation Barbarossa? So we're going to do this in three parts for cohesion because this is going to get out of hand real quick <laughs> as fast. it has in the past of these kind of questions the first part will be why didn't this happen in the first place so the actual history the second part what we think would occur shut the fuck up know your fucking place trash if japan went ahead with this lunacy and the third part is what happens to the greater history of the world what would today look like it's gonna go really down the rabbit hole so part Very one <laughs> part one i'm just gonna ask you what you know basically of why did japan not attack the soviet union in 1941 operation barbarossa kind of time frame uh well i don't know much on the first battle like i i have a hard time pronouncing it so uh if you could pronounce the first battle maybe i can uh, learn it the battle of uh Kalkingo. Gulf and Gulf. Yes, that one I'm really not too familiar on myself. I am more familiar on the second battle of the Battle of Lake Kazan with uh, Zukov as the, uh, the commanding school. leader. So I think it's best maybe you go over the first one a little and then I can jump in about the second one. All right. So uh, for listeners who listen to my other podcast with Kings and Generals, I actually did both these battles and I think the episode was Tensions in the Pacific, if I'm not mistaken, or it was actually talking about World War II in general. The Battle of Kalkingol was a absolute shit fest that occurred because, well, the Soviet Union and the Japanese Empire are bitter rivals ever since the Russo-Japanese War, as anyone could imagine. They kept a lot of units on the front lines of Manchuria. The Kwangtung Army, for example, was the ones there. And they had a puppet state of Manchu Kuo, which is Manchuria at that point. And uh, right beside it uh, is, you know, the current state of Mongolia. So... Mongolia at this point is kind of a puppet state of the Soviets, and then Manchu Kuo is a puppet state of the Japanese. They have skirmishes all the time, little border clashes, nothing amounts to too much. But the Russians see what they think is kind of a weakness on a mountain range. Mongols are also involved. Allegedly, they go over and they try to establish kind of like a foothold. Japanese see this, the Japanese don't want this to happen. What was just a skirmish in the beginning turns into a full scale and one of the bloodiest battles you've ever seen. And we're seeing, you know, aircraft mechanized warfare, limited, mind you, compared to what will be in the second one. And uh, it's a bloody nose for both countries. But I think anyone would argue more of a, a victory for the Russians. The Japanese yes. certainly got battered, but not battered enough to just leave it alone. Because I no. guess you can bring up what happens well, almost from, the same situation yeah. later. Yeah, like I said, like from, from what I do know about this battle, it, it was Japan testing the waters for a second time. It was Japan seeing what is the better route to take? Should we go after the U.S. or should we go after Russia for our resources? And so in this battle, the Japanese thought, let's probe again. Let's see. I know Russia is very divided right now within Stalin. There's not a lot of cohesion. Like, they think that, okay, oh, you know what? We have a good army. We could probably just swept them aside. Well, the Soviet Far East was not a great military force. It was lackluster, you know, kind of reservist a little bit at this point. So they were a bit weak over there. 
They were, especially considering to the Western front of the Soviets, who had uh, countless rifle divisions, <laughs> countless tank divisions. Yes, dated tank divisions, and even more dated in the East with the, uh, I believe it's the T-25s they had. But in the West, they were peacefully occupying Poland to secure the Polish people. Yes, yes, of course. Of course, because, of course. You know, those Poles clearly had Need intention of world conquest and had to be put down during World War II. Jeez, such an awful story. <laughs> it, it, it really is, but not to go down that road. Of, <laughs> we, maybe that's a podcast in the future. What if Poland had defended itself? Well, they defended themselves. It. It's just they got I mean, really like, messed over six, by... Yeah, like if... I should say not defended. They did. They put up one of the most... Put a valiant stuff. defense against they two world-leading militaries. I, I cannot stress a, a, enough the Poles' defense in the situation they were was one of the most brilliant defenses you possibly could. Yeah, you're going to get me killed by the Polish community here. I know. I, I really want to stress, like, the Poles, holy God, their defense, like, they put so much hurt on the Germans coming in, but the Germans never talked about it. But oh, uh, yeah, I think... It was we, propaganda. It was yeah. like, it was like, they called it like a clean, easy. Mm-hmm. They said their Luftwaffe took out most of the stuff, whereas it wasn't actually that easy. No, the, air, no. the aircraft of the Polish Air Force actually did some damage to them back. No, Anyways, not just around. That, the Polish tank divisions really put some hurt on the Germans. Like the Poles had some pretty heavy tanks that were pretty hard to knock out. Now, once again, we really got distracted. I can see how this... <laughs> that's why, history, yeah, that's why I'm trying so to wild. wrangle yeah, in. So getting back to the uh, Battle of Lake uh, Gazan. So their commander was there was, was General Zukov, which, of course, anyone who knows World War II, he becomes in a very important figure. This was actually where he really made shown, his yeah. name. This is where he like, shown up. He, he, yeah. he rose to power, yeah. And it was at this point that Stalin actually was like, I can't touch him anymore. He is actually a national. Like, he became... The, man, the only man Stalin feared, as they call it. Yeah, because he literally had the people on his side, too. It was... It was. I want to survive. (laughs) All he did was his job. (laughs) All he did was be a very competent leader, and he did that at this battle. The even though the um, they were using, let's say, outdated equipment for the late 1930s, they still had the equipment, which the Japanese, for some reason, thought they didn't need more planes. They didn't need anything more than light tanks at this battle. They only needed more or less rifle divisions. Well, they didn't have that. They didn't. Well, I mean, they did have a lot in Manchuria. It's like, yes, it's a significant amount of the IGAs there, but they didn't necessarily have the highest end equipment right at the border, mind you. Yeah. Well, they only had light tanks at that point going up. They don't have anything but light tanks throughout the war. Actually, like one medium variant or something, but they only thought they needed light tanks. They didn't really, that that wasn't their focus, but yeah. But you're forgetting that tagger that was sent by the Germans to help them with their heavy tank production. Oh, yeah, (laughs) yeah. They they, they were more interested in building ships for for, for valid reasons. But so, yeah, so um, the the Japanese uh, thought we're going to probe the border against in in Manchuria, see if we can put, and if we can, well, we're going to go after Russia then, even though, because they wanted the oil, even though I know Siberia has a lot of natural resources back then, they didn't know that much. Well, they they, they didn't tap into them yet. So they weren't, they weren't easily accessible. And the Japanese did not have the qualified technicians to know how to get the oil out properly. They didn't know where to find it. It was impossible. They're not going to find it. So like so the once the battle started actually before the battle started the actual russian air force just to show like the lopsided nature of the, what this battle would be they started pounding the japanese while they were preparing to invade russia like the russians knew this was coming the zukov knew well it wasn't so, i won't call, we'll call it an invasion of russia but they wanted to take that attack. territory they wanted a buffer state basically in that area yeah. and so when the japanese finally get their attack underway Zhukov did a brilliant maneuver. Like, I'm not going to go into too big of details, but essentially he did an encirclement maneuver with his medium T-25s and other mechanized units where the Japanese started pushing, pushing his front line. He just sent his flanks completely with their speed and maneuver around the army. And that's what scared the shit out of the Japanese was because the speed of what he was about to do. He was literally about to cut off the entire Japanese army being sent there. And it's essentially what led to the ceasefire being called and then eventually down the road a non-aggression pact with 
Russia, but that we'll, we'll cover later in this podcast. But essentially, Zhukov's brilliant tactician won the day. He outmaneuvered the Japanese. Yeah, I'll, mind, I'll, I'll add to the audience. I, I told them in the podcast that they had listened to it. One of the biggest reasons why Zhukov won was actually he had a fleet of trucks that were bringing all of his mechanized units, his infantry and everything, straight to the front lines from a, a back-end, uh, I don't know if it was an airfield or a military base. And the Japanese never were good with logistics. They did not have a mechanized, like, they had never, they never achieved real good logistics when it came to moving troops. Like, the best was Yamashita in Malaya. And it was impressive, but it not not outstanding by any measure. Zukov could bring units too much faster. He had too many more mechanized units. It was overwhelming the mechanized warfare yeah. on his side. Whereas the Japanese had the numbers of people and probably yeah. the artillery to like take it out. And the Russians got battered too. That's why they had a ceasefire. But what Zukov was throwing at them, like this, the, the Japanese mm-hmm. freaked out when they saw this. They it really triggered them because they realized they were in a situation where it's like we don't have the mechanized warfare to counter the Soviets. And we're currently building up our Navy to such an extent that we don't even have the necessary resources to move it over here if we wanted to go against the Russians. So they're like, okay, we're going to need to just put men on the border and pray to God they don't come over. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, not just that, like, this battle was pure propaganda for the Soviets. Like, they, after this battle, they, uh, it was close to 6,500 Soviet officers were awarded medals, decorations, um, 26 of them were actually awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union, which is one of the biggest uh, awards you, or awards, medals you could be awarded in the military. Like, for, for Stalin, this was pure propaganda, and this I don't know for sure, but I'm thinking this might have had a um, effect on the Russians, like, we can beat the Germans, because look, the Japanese attacked us, if the Germans attack us, well, we beat the Japanese in this small little skirmish. Maybe we can take on the Germans with an actually thought out plan and not well, just all okay. between Jewish, Jewish between the <laughs> German high command in the 30s and the Soviet high command in the 30s. There was no question that the Soviets were going to be more powerful simply because of the amount of population they had and the industry. I mean, Hitler knew he, it was a ticking time bomb. The, yeah. the more he waited, the more the Soviets, you know, after the purge, especially they would be able to rebuild and build a mechanized war machine that the Germans couldn't even possibly compete with. I mean, the the Russians were terrible. I won't call them the Russians. The Soviets were terrifying. Yeah, They were. And just to talk about that purge quickly, uh, just to say, like, it it was a horrible thing, but (laughs) a lot of innocent people died. (laughs) Yeah. But (laughs) trying to, you know, see the glass half full, he did get rid of a lot of the old military, like, aristocrat in the soviet union like and he put in fresh minds he put in new young which yes he of course he could control uh, under soviet propaganda but he brought That's in a lot a whole of good new, ones yeah he brought <laughs> I mean, in a had whole to train new all the new guys generation. but yeah yeah so um I'll, to fill in the gaps a little bit more what i think what a lot of people when they when they think about like uh what we're really this what this podcast is really about is you know the difference between hoku shinran and nan shinran so Nan Shinran is what really happened in our timeline. That's the Southern Strike strategy, where they went after Southeast Asia and the Pacific for the resources they needed to maintain themselves. Hulk Shinran would have been to attack the Soviet Union, which was always adopted by members in the IGA, especially the Kwangtung Army in the Manchuria, and uh, the political faction of you know the Imperial Way, the Kodaha. A lot of their members were, were hardcore Hoku Shinran fanatics. They perform a coup and it fails horribly and they're purged by the Tosia faction, which is uh, Hideki Tojo was part of it. And the Tosia faction, even though they are part of the IGA, they favored not doing Hoku Shinran. They wanted to actually have a, I'm just going to call it a realistic buildup of a military before they would ever approach attacking someone like the Soviets, especially when later on we see this in 1939 with these two battles that go horribly. On top of this, Hitler's actions with Stalin confuse the hell out of the Japanese because they form a pact all of a sudden. Mm-hmm. Japan has already had secret pacts with Germany and they're confused. It's like, oh, you're allying to our enemy, the Soviets. And then they attack Poland and Japan's sitting there like, this is weird because the Germans are telling the Japanese that sometimes that they are planning to attack the Soviets. So the Japanese don't really understand what's going on. They get confused and then eventually they 
form their own neutrality pact. Yeah, yeah it would be like, what else hey, would they do? hey, the U.S. want to come invade China with me so we can each take half of China and then I'm going to take the other half from you in a year. <laughs> and I think a, a lot of people who ask this question, I'm not insulting anybody, but a lot of them are kind of like military video game guys where they, they see on paper what the Japanese empire looks like and they don't take into account like the politics or the reality of the situation number one uh if this is going to happen what time period are you talking about because if you go before 1941 i mean we're changing the whole outcome of japan are they still building up towards nanshinron because this is happening in the mid 30s when they decide we're going to build our navy more and we're going to attack southeast asia so I wanted to make it, you know, just for this podcast alone, we're talking about 1941. We're talking about when Hitler asked Japan to help with Operation Barbarossa. So at this point, they've got 35 of their like 51 divisions. I'll just talk myself here because Eric just like got up. They've got 35 of their divisions in China. So they don't have, they, I mean, they have like 20 divisions they could potentially throw at the Soviets. But what does that really amount to? It's not enough to, you know, take the vast wilderness of Siberia. The distance from Vladivostok to Moscow, for example, is the same distance as like Tokyo to San Francisco. It's like 5,000 miles. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about lack of houses, lack of anything to cut down, resources that are there but couldn't be acquired by the Japanese. And this is all about resources, 1941, because if the Japanese do this, what are they, are they just going to magically find fuel? No one's giving, they're embargoed. They're not getting fuel. They really can't go anywhere else because they're sending 20 of their <laughs> remaining divisions up into the Siberia while 35 of the rest are in China because they can't just leave China. China's yes. the key to this. And China, if they pull out divisions out of China, like China is just going to like counterattack. If they see there's a weakness, they're going to take back their uh, country. And uh, I mean, people hate to, you know, be told this, but uh, the economics don't lie. Uh, if you, you're presenting Japan with a situation, this is how it went down. 1941, Operation Barbarossa, Hitler has asked countless, countless times, can you please come in and help us? And Japan simply states to Germany, they have three demands. I actually wrote it down. Their demands for them to engage the Russians. Number one, Moscow has to be captured. Hmm. Number two, the Kwangtung army needs to be three times bigger than the Soviet Far East forces. And number three, a civil war has to be started in Siberia. These are some pretty large conditions. Yeah, uh, the third one, I think, is, let's be honest, the most unrealistic. Like, the second one is highly improbable. If Moscow fell, a civil war? Very likely in Russia. They would, uh, there's a lot of opportunists. Hey, look at Chechens today. Yeah, I know, but like, if asked. you go back to the Soviets' mentality back then, yeah, they were pushed all the way back to Moscow, and the people were even more, the more Germany invaded, the more patriotic and steadfast they were. Like, because the more Germany went inland, the more atrocities they were heard about, the more uh, shocking news the Stalin would uh, use as propaganda for his population. Like, their population hated the Germans, and I think that hatred would have overcome even if Moscow fell, that hatred for the Germans would have stayed. Yeah. So if you're Japanese high command and you have roughly 20 divisions out of your 51 divisions that you could either go into Southeast Asia and the Pacific and attack what? Um, some, I'm sorry to say, some third, at that point, third world countries who don't have very strong developed armies that could do anything against you. A few outposts of the British, which although they are British, the British are currently really yes. in a bad place with germany they can't really do much to protect those and yeah. uh, well the dutch and the dutch put a formidable defense but they're again uh exiled governments they're not going to get any resources they're going to be easily taken over yeah and let's remember the japanese navy at that point it really was yeah. the strongest navy problem is of course the united states and that's the crux of everything and the united states is the one kind of edging them in with the embargoes mm -hmm. that really does push them over the edge or are you going to send 20 of your divisions through 5,000 miles of Siberia in the hopes that you don't run out of fuel, that most of your infantry who are on bicycles in Siberia get across it magically? Because you don't have the yeah. mechanized, you're not going to, you don't have the trucks for it. So it's not to mention it's the not gear, logical. 
the wear and tear of the weather in Siberia. I've never been to Siberia, but uh, uh, Siberia yeah. now is not what it was then. Siberia now, yeah. yeah, sure, you have houses that are around. Back mm-hmm. then, there wasn't that many even trees around that where they could they wouldn't there be was, able to survive. Correct me if I'm wrong. There was one railroad back then. Like, which would have been cut because the defenders yeah. as, as we see in world war one defenders control the railways and you're what are you going to do like you're not going to take mm-hmm. their russia's railway to all the way to moscow and they're going to be like oh wow, what a surprise Actually, you showed up this is know? a fair question i just thought of because the germans had to switch out all of the rail tracks when yep. they invaded the soviets would the japanese have also been because that severely hampered the germans because for the supply lines that they couldn't have but they were able to take the territory where the train tracks were too that's the point whereas the japanese yes of course. i mean i'm talking if the japanese managed to get past what was in the far east which i don't know if the audience understands despite operation barbarossa the siberian core was kept oh yeah where it was and that's going to be part of part two we'll get into that that's like the big question a lot but if the japanese get past that and i mean they're going to have to throw the kitchen sink but it's going to be hard. And, and even if even, they do, what do they earn? Yeah. It's Yeah, it doesn't make too much sense. And worst case, think of this. You attack the, the Russians. Well, what if the same thing happens as it before? The Russians fight back and start pushing you back, start pushing back into your territory. The Japanese had to have known there was a chance that if they fail, they the Soviets could invade. Manchukuo wouldn't of well i mean they to be realistic i mean they had a million men strong just in manchu quo so and and in 1945 when the russians do absolutely smash the forces yeah but that was like the the japanese were done like there was nothing Well, the thing is the forces that were there had been there the entire war they had just been sitting like yes some troops were taken away for obvious reasons but that that border was always sustained If I remember correctly, they took uh, a few of the crack, like their crack special divisions, like the most experienced divisions they had, along with a few tank divisions to support not just Moscow, but then also, of course, Stalingrad in the uh, the massive counteroffensive. I think it was Operation Uranus, I believe. Yeah, well, when Stalin, because Stalin had a uh, intelligence in, he had spies everywhere, and especially yes. in Japan, and he got word that Japan was not going to break the ceasefire in '41 uh, at the end of Operation Barbarossa, and that uh, they weren't coming, and that's what freed up the Siberian Corps. That's what allowed him to finally move it. So actually, you know, we're we're done with part one now. So we're yeah. going to actually talk about, for some strange reason, this happens. They they do attack say the uh, uh, who, uh the russian ambassador who was the spy for uh Ribbentrop? Soviet... yeah and unfortunately uh, well, he's not the spy he was uh sorry he was what do you call it the envoy the yeah, anyways yeah oh then maybe i missed uh mixed I up think, my wires. i don't know if i'm wrong there but, okay uh, no but yeah so if so what happens if they do try and invade i think if it, it depends on the time, of course, also. Are we talking, are they invading 1940 when the Germans haven't invaded Russia? Are no, we talking no, 41? Because it, it has to be June 1941, Operation so Barbarossa. The same as Operation Barbarossa. Ooh, here, continue to talk. I just realized I just got to plug in this laptop. Uh, oh, you got to do it. So, Luckily, from, I, have my I think the same thing happens is that the Japanese logistics are too far crippled in that region for it to actually be successful. Of course. Like, how many divisions could they allocate to this? Like, yeah, they put 20 divisions in that region before, but how oh, many no. of them... They, they can, they can if they, because they have 50, they have about 51 yeah. divisions in total in their entire military, yeah. and about 35 are within China, and they are not coming out. I mean, yeah. maybe they could take troops here or there, but you're going, you're going to get about roughly 20 divisions if you're lucky. Mm-hmm. to to do this operation we'll just say that they do it for some so reason so then i believe their first move would to be december 7th 1941 instead of the attack on pearl harbor december that's not a good time though because then Mo- moscow it's been good like the the siberian core at that point has already gone over and um they've already beaten the hell out of the germans and pushed them back so this is what gets sticky a lot of people argue this they're like oh well if the Japanese just threw away all potential gains for themselves and just only thought about what's good for Germany for some reason, and they attacked when Hitler asked, 
well, then the Siberian Corps can't go over to 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 Moscow for the great save and all this because you know everyone talks yeah. about like wow, what a big push. The thing is, the Battle of Moscow was basically over before the Siberian Corps yeah. ever got there. Same with Stalingrad too. The they had yes, they were quite helpful in the push for opportunities, but it would have happened, I think, anyways. Like. It was the just going to be worse, yeah. bloodier, a lot more civilians getting killed. But yeah, it, it looks like, and I know uh, Alternate History Hub even, I think, touched this. Yeah. If the Siberian Corps has to stay and fight off the Japanese, it doesn't mean that Moscow falls because it really mm -hmm. looks like, yes, the Siberian Corps comes at that last minute. But at that last minute, it seems that Moscow was safe because the winter had settled in. Mm -hmm. They both hunkered down. And the offensive that happens, yeah, right after Operation Barbarossa kind of gets stalled, yes, the offensive is not going to go very well without the Siberian Corps. It's going to be a little cumbersome. It's still coming, though. And I don't think the Germans are, they're not going to get hit as hard, but they're going to get hit. It's, oh, it's uh, not going of course. 80 for... Uh, so then let's say instead of December 7th to try and be, you know... Uh, it has to be in like June. Yeah, okay. Uh, so July, say June, August. I think the Japanese first place to attack is Vladivostok. I think they do yep. a naval invasion. I think they do something very similar to Pearl Harbor. What, what else is the Navy going to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> like it's the only but target. Instead of just bombing ships, they're going to bomb the port and then they're going to land a bunch of Japanese there. And then that's going to be their main off point towards Moscow. <laughs> like literally some of the, the furthest point from Moscow to be there. And then they would try to push probably using what limited infrastructure is in Siberia to try and push through the Russians and I think they would gain a bit like I think they would push they would get a little bit of traction but eventually the Russians would just consolidate around them and once the Japanese logistical problems come into play like always happen like soldiers on bikes in winter well you ain't going that far <laughs> and I think with the Russian air force that was still there they would have bombed them because eventually the the navy's aircraft carrier or aviation they can only go so far and yes the japanese does have army fighters i think it's the kiwa kiwi or not kiwi uh, uh kiwa 45 or 25 uh a land-based fighter which well, they was and they got the uh, they yeah. mean they have the kate is not to well i mean uh they have a number of fighters, but you know what? For when it comes to Vladivostok, I think it would just be the IGN that takes care of it. Uh, no, of course it would. It would be carriers, but it's once they push past that, the carriers oh, can't yeah, support land, them anymore. Fighters and you have to understand, those fighters are being used in China right now. Like they are needed by those 35 divisions that are trying to push through China because they didn't stop attacking China in this scenario. Because the second can't, they stop, can't they happen. can't. So those resources are still going to China. So this is almost like a secondary operation for them. And I'll just to explain to people, because that, that might be confusing. It's like, what do you mean that they, they, they cannot stop the war in China? They can't stop the war in China. It actually, it's like the make or break for their entire empire. The entire rationale for why they need resources to survive is because of the war in China. It's basically everything that they have. The reason why they go to war with the United States and everything is to try and complete the war with China. Funny enough, it's a... It's a Chinese finger trap, actually, if you think about it, because the deeper they got in, the more they got, you know. But yeah. um, not to mention, you, like, oh. uh, so say, uh, if they when once they invade, Mao is just going to have an even more like yep. reason to fight them even harder. He's going to have Stalin telling him, "We're fighting them in the north. You better get your ass down there and start pushing from the south and all that." Because Mao's in the middle. forces aren't actually actively doing this. The second front collapses because of the relationship between Chiang Kai-shek and Mao, and Mao pulls back. I mean, there's two major offensives, but Mao goes to town on his generals that perform them because he's angry. He says, we don't lose numbers. We want the nationalists to fight this, to hurt each other with the Japanese, and then we're going to sweep in at the end. That was his whole plan. Yes. Well, but now, Stalin now would probably different. be like, yeah, Stalin would be saying, I'm fighting up north. You get your ass down there and you start pushing or I'm cutting off your supply. But also another thing, if they're fighting up north, now they're on two fronts, they might not be able to push to close the Burma Road again. They might not be able to push to close off. The Chai well, we'll, we'll get there because we Ryan. haven't even talked about, yeah. is there a war with the West? Oh, we, yeah. We'll sorry. I think we're getting it. But yeah, what I truly believe happens, they supply it. They, they get some maneuver. And, but once they realize the logistical nightmare of trying to push through, 
the Russians start pushing back and then the Japanese have to continuously funnel supplies and resources to hold the line. And I think they could. They start entrenching. They've proven they could do that when, oh, the, yeah. when the Americans were attacking. I guarantee, looking at this scenario, Vladivostok is literally sacrificed. Like, I think he would pull, like, Stalin would pull all of his oh, yeah, forces that, out. That was gone. They, Moscow that was, is more important than yeah. Vladivostok. I mean, it's it's a cold water port. It's not even a warm water port. Yeah. He's not keeping at. I think knows. Stalin is Stalin doesn't care how much of the East is lost. It's just stop it's endless. It's an endless yeah. buffer of geo. It's geography. Yeah. It's it's ridiculous. It's essentially it's a war of attrition. It. I'm I'm sure Stalin would instruct them a war of attrition. Kill as many of them as you can as they come in. One, but I I was doing research when I was looking into this. You know, you get the numbers, and one guy says something, and it really struck me. I thought it was so funny, but it's oddly true. He said, "Okay." In this scenario, the Japanese, they defeat like the Far East Russian forces and they're managing to go into Siberia. Now they're at war with bears, tigers, otters, yeah. um, beavers and stuff. It's like there's nothing out there for 5,000 miles or so. What w- what are you going to do? Like, Not to mention, like even the their Japanese. clothes. I don't even know if they would have proper winter gear for that's Siberia. A, that's of course. Because this is going to be in winter. The Japanese had the mentality of their soldiers should forage for themselves for their own supplies. How? What do you? Yeah, with rice, you have to boil the rice. Like a lot of people don't realize that uh, the Pacific Island hop, uh, island hopping warfare, a big problem for the Japanese was they had to lug, like physical food on their backs all the time. They didn't have MRE rations. They would have to lug up like a sack of rice. You have to go in the middle of the night and light a fire in Siberia. How the hell? Where are you going to find the lumber? It's not. It's not abundant. Like yes, there's of course trees around stuff and you can find it, but it's not abundant for the mm-hmm. amount of twenty divisions of people you're going to bring, and the exactly. fuel. Do you even have fuel that's going to last in winter, or are you going to run in the same situation as the Germans, where they're like, oh, we yeah. didn't, uh, we didn't have, we didn't have cars and, and trucks and all that. They can actually go into winter with the proper fuel, so it just froze up on us because only Canadians and Russians know this stuff, I guess. Yeah. But where, but the Russians would still there be bracing. They would be doing like what they did in the. Uh, well, I guess that would be the West for them now, because <laughs> we always say in the East as in Russia. But this is like the East East. So the, the best <laughs> argument I've heard, and I don't, I don't like this argument because it's mm-hmm. so flimsy. It's Stalin had a, he had a mental breakdown when Hitler op- did Operation Barbarossa. Yeah. Like he literally like locked himself in a room and like he was catatonic. If the Japanese attacked simultaneously, would that have thrown him off the edge? And does he I don't know, kill himself or something? And does someone else I take I don't think so. Because once it, this, there's so many different sources, like not different sources, but like different, different opinions ways this on could it. go down. Yeah. yeah. But in the actual reality, when, like you said, when Hitler invades, Stalin goes in isolation for three days. No one can talk to him. He won't talk to anyone. He is like completely devastated. He then comes out after those three days to his um, chief of staff and all that. He sits down with him and is saying, and this is apparently what he said. It's not for sure. We don't know for sure, but he said, I am incapable of ruling. I did not see this coming. Who will take over from me? Because I cannot. I've heard this one. That's a myth. It's a real myth. I know, but I think it goes well with this because then no one takes it up. And I do believe the same thing would happen people feared stalin far so too much, much yeah like i said like they stood behind him as they pushed all the way to moscow and the people fought harder and harder the farther they got in like oh and by the way for the audience moscow isn't a win scenario either mm-hmm. if moscow fell a lot of people would argue with you it doesn't mean anything because okay. i mean stalin was moving all the industry sure his yeah. entire governmental organism you know his military structure command and everything is completely screwed but he could technically move it and maybe stalin is killed if moscow's taken That's by his a own possibility people. we don't know maybe stalin would have been the patriotic i'm gonna stand with the city and fall who knows but i mean you know when you look at it napoleon like the classic That's example exactly. when napoleon took moscow what did they do they just burnt it down to the ground and he le- they left the the french just to sit there like oh and I mean, like, again, that's why Hitler was like so crazy about, oh, we can't focus too much on Moscow. We need to, well, I'm not going to run into what Napoleon did. But uh, t- to get back to one other point, because I know people are really, there's going to be nitpickers as we call them. Of course, but this is once again, it's hypothetical history. Uh, the, none of this is, t- like it didn't happen. Anything the, could happen. The Siberian Corps, 
because I had to make sure I got my dates correct here. Let me yeah. look at my, I had notes on this. It's so like, it's during October, between October and November, a thousand tanks, a thousand aircraft, Siberian Corps eventually come from the, from the Siberian Far East and they make it to Moscow for Operation, uh, what was it, Typhoon or something? Oh yeah, oh, it was Typhoon and then Operation Uranus. That was, Oh uh, yeah, no, Uranus is, yeah, after, but uh, for Typhoon, by October, November, like Moscow is saved basically like the winter yeah. settling like it's the situation has already basically been won so this whole thing like a lot of people always put it on the siberian core question and i'm like i don't think it's enough to upset the balance i think it's not going to change too much in the grander scheme of things if the siberian core stays or who says he doesn't pull them because if he does pull he's going to pull vladivostok's forces away why yeah. doesn't he pull at least half the siberian core away he honestly he could maybe he wouldn't pull as much. I think, yes, he would not pull the forces he did pull because he knew, well, Japan's not going to attack. I can take my cracked Siberian core. I can take some aircraft, some tanks, shoot them over and throw whatever I can at the Germans. Yeah. The rest will stay there just in case the Japanese, you know, go back on their word. But I can take now with Japan attacking and once they start pushing, but once he sees the Japanese start stalling, this is the the most important part once he sees that juggernaut of japan start slowing down start start being like maybe pushed back a little halted song can be like you know what i need to focus on germany that front oh trenches hold the lines i'm gonna beat the crap out of the germans then i'm gonna send you Oh, no. And uh, for, for those of you looking at this from an economic point of view, I just want to reiterate, uh, we keep saying that Buddy of Vostok is basically a sacrificial lamb and it's gone. A lot of people will know that that's... Oh, maybe you want to mute that? Here, just mute yourself. I'll talk to the audience. Oh, my God. Uh, so Vladivostok of Vostok is one of the main points of entry for something like the Lend Lease and, you know, any of the goods coming from America it's not significant compared to the other ones like the Persian, um, what do you call it? The Persian uh, corridor, I think it was called, where stuff would come through the Middle East. Here, I almost muted you because the doc, sorry, the audio audience there. No, uh, that, unfortunately, not many people know. I got a dog last week. And... Congratulations. Oh, it's yeah. a COVID dog. <laughs> what do they call them? COVID the puppies? But uh, to just reiterate, uh, the lend lease and all the supplies going into Russia, it's not going to be that much yeah, by the because... capture of Vladivostok. <laughs> I just muted you. Yeah, there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, because there were some supplies coming in from Vladivostok, God. but I know. <laughs> I'll make this point quick. Um, there were some supplies coming in from Vladivostok, but the most of the supplies were coming through the Arctic Pathway. We're coming through um, the southern approaches, where, through like Turkey and stuff like that. Yeah. They, they and there's were the northern supplies. approach too. There's the yeah. whole north of Russia. Through, like that was uh, the Ar Arctic, Arctic, Arctic uh, Passage. That's where the majority of the supplies actually came yeah. from the States, not Vladivostok. Because I mean, it was awkward. Like it, it's funny to say this, the Japanese never thwarted the transport of goods from the United States to Vladivostok <laughs> as long as there was a, you know, a USSR flag on the ship because they were so terrified of the Soviets yeah. entering the war. So anyways, this is a side detail, but, but yeah. it's not going to make a difference is what I'm saying. And uh, I think that, yeah, like you said, the supply is what's going to kill Japan. I think they don't have the equipment for it. The, the Russians at this point would have started producing T-34s. I and mean, yes, most of them would have gone to, the, to fight the Germans, but of course, probably some would have been sent out there. They're innovating their air force constantly. The, the Japanese didn't. And in this scenario, they also wouldn't. So I, just I mean, think... it, it's 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 silly because like a lot of people, they want to see this and they just magically think, OK, well, the Japanese, they, they don't focus on uh, the Navy. And they're actually yeah. they're this new thing. They're going to medium tanks. You have this and they have like, no, because like it started before like this yeah way the, before the production so. when you build a navy you don't say i need a navy next year so let's start building ships no you need to plan decades before you'd be and like good luck to the iga getting the japanese navy to you know back off of not being at their throats for funds <laughs> like you were talking about before politics if yeah. this is all the army's invasion the navy is going to be like well we are going to go do something and what's going to happen the navy is probably going to do something impulsive <laughs> like they tended to do and open up a third front somehow through some yeah. 
And he's, they're like, you know what? Oh, we're actually getting low. You know what probably happens? As they start realizing their supply situation is lower and lower, they're like, we need to get more resources. I guess we need to go invade the Dutch, Dutch East Indies. But maybe we need- this is where it gets weird because yeah. it was a sneaky plan. They had all their 20 divisions lined up, you know, in all these positions in Southeast Asia, ready to hit simultaneous targets. That's not going to happen in the circumstance. So. Yeah. You're looking at, oh, the British and the French are even like looking at French Indochina and they're looking at, you know, places like Milan, like, oh, the Japanese are getting a little sneaky. Maybe we're just going to make sure defenses are a little bit heightened for mm-hmm. the next year. It's a completely different monster. And how do the other countries look at this? Are they going to help the Japanese? Be opt- are they going to be opportunity, you know, it's an opportunity to go after the Russians. What I think happens is it's a war of attrition. It becomes a stalemate in the sense that the Russians have to focus on the Germans. It, it, they have to, well, yes, even if the yes. Japanese invade. But what happens now is, I don't see it becoming like World War I, but I see it becoming more of a slow pushback of the Japanese, yeah. or merely a, the Japanese throwing themselves against Russian defenses. It really, ultimately, and it's sad to say, it all pales in comparison to how does the United States of America react to this? Because... It's it, this is real alternate history. You know, FDR was looking for a way to get into the war, but the populace of the United States would not go for it. And he doesn't want to be lynched, basically, for trying to do anything like that. So how does he get a war with even Germany at that point? Unrestricted submarine warfare like World War One? Maybe. Maybe that equals out. And if the United States does manage to find a way to go to war with Germany, it's over. Germany's done. Like, uh, yeah, I, I think we're getting a little into part three now, but well, yeah, okay, this is part three. Yeah, it's the theme of uh, how does this look in history? Because I think, yeah, you brought it up. The most important factor in all of this is the U.S. Because the U.S. joined the war because they were attacked, like they were directly attacked. It was by the, the Japanese, and I mean, it, insult to injury is Hitler going, "Yes, and we declare war." Yeah, like on you, it's like it, it, oh, it's okay, a, it's a strong possibility. The U.S. might not have declared war on Germany hmm. and would have focused Japan, but would have upped the supply because they would have um, cha- they would have still militarized their economy to do a mass production. But now they can just ship even more unrestricted uh, lend lease policy. Like I can't even imagine. Well, can you imagine the United States just only shipping more aircraft to Britain to just bomb exactly. the hell out of Germany? Like this would have been Dresden times a thousand. It would but have that's been like, so I feel bad. Like even if the U.S. doesn't join the war on either front, which I feel is very even if they just lovely. fund everybody, they're gonna win. Like the Soviets will win they, probably in forty nine yeah. or something. Who knows? Anyone who plays a uh, Hearts of Iron Four will know this. The yeah. U.S. is just a giant civilian factory where you just and military but you just produce for the world. And if the U.S. doesn't have to supply its own army or doesn't have to, it would build up its army, of course, but not to the level that it would have if it had joined, if it didn't join the war. The amount of planes, tanks, rifles, bullets, food, most importantly, fuel, even more importantly, that would have been shipped to all the allies would have been even more than what they did. Yeah, it's like Operation war. Uranus. It's like the amount of American jeeps that was involved exactly. in that and stuff is like astronomical. So uh, I think what happens if the U.S. doesn't uh, declare war on Japan, but does declare war on Germany, what I think happens, the Russians, even if Japan invades, the Russians hold them. And eventually the Germans, they didn't, the Germans lost, not just because of the Russians, I mean, mostly because of the Russians, but the Germans also had issues that would have crippled them no, no matter oil. what. No actual oil, industry. Transportation, the fact that they had to change the, the track gauges on their trains as they moved through Russia. They had and no were, full wartime economy until like 44. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, just to give you one little example, like the Russians, how they thought like every single foot soldier always carried their overcoat on them, like their winter jacket. If you see that like kind of blanket yeah. around their shoulder, that's their open. They always had it on them. So at nighttime, if it was cold, they had a blanket in the winter, they always had it. The Germans didn't, for the first year, they didn't even give their soldiers hey, winter hey. equipment because they didn't I've listened want to, to podcasts and they had newspapers that they could put in their clothes and it really made it warmer really? and some of them lived. <laughs> so what I think happens is because there are less divisions pulled out of the East, the Russians still, even if Moscow falls, Stalin 
like we were talking before, they actually expected Moscow to fall. And yeah. like the good thing about Russia, their military schools, which I feel like maybe not everyone knows that every country's military schools reflect their own history of military actions. So for the Russians, like you said before, how many times has a Russia been invaded and Moscow lost? The military schools teach their officers and all that, these what happened and all that. They would know that we've lost Russia in the past. I mean, we've lost Moscow in the past. It's not we'll the it worst, again. yeah. Like, it's not the end game. Exactly. No, we're still going to win. And let's and not they... forget, if anyone's read Mein Kampf, they're like, oh, okay, let's read the part where it says, oh, we're going to, like, basically just kill all the Slav people mm-hmm. and make this just lands for the new German Volk. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't sound like we can just surrender. We're going to have to fight. <laughs> but that's exactly it. So what I think happens is the Russians do stop the Germans. Maybe it's past Moscow. I don't think they take Stalingrad. Merely because, like Moscow, yeah, there were Siberian corps were sent to help, like to help with the counterattack and so on. But by the time that happened, the Germans were faltering. It's just going to be worse. Already. It's just going to be bloodier. It's, the Germans are going to. It's going to be back longer, and... to be honest, for the Russians because they don't have as many forces. They still will have enough forces to push the Germans back, but with less forces, it would take them longer. So what would happen if, once again, if the U.S. does declare war on Germany, which I think very likely i think they find some reason they will come up with one as the war continues they will figure something you know out. What? let's let's go into the territory here because i mean i'm gonna be honest even as i am a i am a fellow youtuber but one of my favorite youtube channels i always watch is alternate history hub and they did yeah. quasi cover this and uh, i think the episode is what if pearl harbor didn't happen and he tried to really figure out a, a reason why the United States wouldn't join the war. And he even tried to think of what if the United States remained completely neutral, mm-hmm. which is bonkers, absolutely bonkers. Uh, I, yeah, I still think it's it just, it would not happen. But what he predict, well, what he put in his episode as a kind of ending to this scenario is really surprising, I think, and grueling. And it's interesting when you think about the actual history. Germany eventually falls, God knows what year, maybe 47, 49, who knows. Yeah. And then the Soviet beast is going to take its battle-hardened veterans, like it did in 45 in our timeline. And it's not going to just overwhelm Manchuria. It's going to full-on perform an invasion of the Japanese main islands. Mm -hmm. While the Americans were quite scared of the idea of invading the main islands, you know, about the casualties and that. I don't think that Stalin cared so much about casualties. No, I think yeah. that World War II just showed, like, uh, it, was, uh, it was Zhukov who said it uh, one time when he came up to a minefield, like, uh, there was, I think, a British advisor, or there was a foreign advisor, and he, he saw that Zhukov said for a company to walk through a minefield, and he was saying, well, why, why are you doing that? You're sending them to their death, and he, and he said, well... If I send in the tanks, they'll blow up from the mines. If I send in the mine clearers, the Germans will just kill them all. It's easier to just send in a company of riflemen, them clear the the mines with their bodies, and then then I'll send in my tanks. Then I'll send in the rest of my forces through there. Now, I'm skeptical, unlike Alternate History Hub, who goes full-blown, like uh, the mainlands get taken over. The Russians don't have the Navy, and paratroopers in world war ii do not do not really do like i mean operation sea lion was never going to really work i don't well, know how the russians are going to actually get enough mechanized and whatever forces they need to take the main islands but by taking japan's empire away from it so we're talking about like southeast asia you know manchuria and all that point is so crippling that it, it completely breaks the back of japan and even if they hunker down in, in japan just despite the fact the russians don't have a navy to really blockade them does not mean that they're not blockaded because if Mm -hmm. nobody does deals with the japanese where are they going to get their food where are they going to get the resources like it's this is like a game maker. i feel like all scenarios more or less go the same direction it's very hard for japan to win unless like you said that decisive battle does happen and somehow they win but like in that area that russia would you say would eventually invade the mainland but I have a counter uh, idea to this. If the U.S. Um, declares war on Germany, but not Japan, the U.S. purely focuses its military in Europe. So they still invade Africa. And then they invade Italy. But they, then they invade France. 
earlier than what had actually happened in World War II, maybe 43. And not just that, uh, the Russians still pushing, but the Russians are further back than when they were before in, in World War II. Yeah, because the Americans maybe, might even pull back a few of that lend lease just to be like, hey, we're going to yeah. just slip into Germany. And, but this would also be a more bloody war because I think oh, if, if the bad. U.S. invades earlier than 1944, the German army is still a fighting force in 43 and in 42, still an extremely good fighting force. So they would put the hurt, but just U.S. numbers and the Air Force, it's the Air Force because the Luftwaffe would, yeah. wouldn't be able, like the combined efforts of that much American industry in Britain fighting back. I think the Luftwaffe would actually die. Like it would be killed in a year. Like I don't know what the Battle of it would, Britain, it would be, be a hurt. second Battle I, of Britain. I don't know if it would be killed, but I think it would definitely be. They would be devastated. But I also think as the U.S. evades, the Germans have to pull back from the east. They have to start bringing that line back. So and they're losing they start, Norway. They're losing Yeah, so other I think places, they're going to pull yeah. back. And what I think happens is the Allies actually push to Germany, through Germany, while the Russians push through the Eastern Europe. And I think the map changes slightly at the end. I think the Allies keep Germany or maybe still give Russia half. But you know, I know people don't want to hear this, but Hitler would not surrender to the Soviets if they were bashing on the door. But if it was America and Britain that were the main you know, guys on his doorstep, yeah, Hitler might be like, ah, shit. Uh, and so, I'm going to so have to surrender. Let's say... And then it's a war against the Soviets. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying. But I say, oh. so it's still maybe 44 now, latest 45, Germany still loses. Because I feel like Germany's strength would still be able to hold off for longer on the continent. But when that happens, I think the reverse of World War II happens. I think then the U.S. declares war on the uh, Japanese, and they start pushing through, um, even though the Japanese didn't invade the islands, or maybe they did. I think they start sweeping through, and I think what happens then is Japan surrenders to the U.S. again. But to save itself, yeah. It makes because sense. the Russians are like, just massively because I mean, the united states down. has the philippines as a base of operations and they can just lay waste yeah. the japanese main islands from there it's, and, it's, un, yeah. it's not fair at all and in your situation which was 47 my situation 44 45 the same thing i think happens yeah. so Douglas, versus yeah. douglas uh, macarthur yeah. pronounces himself a new emperor over japan because <laughs> he would do that <laughs> yeah, i i can see him doing that but I think what happens afterwards, the same divide happens between communism and democracy. And I feel like- It's just a cold war, but a little different. Yeah, yeah. it's the map would just be different. I think Russia would control more of Asia and less of Europe. It would be terrifying because they get all of Korea, Southeast Asia for sure, it's all theirs. Exactly. And what and happens think... with China? China is gonna be more Mao than ever because Mao's going to win yes, uh, and he I might be a that, puppet of Stalin. But that's what I'm thinking. I don't think Mao has the same independence from Stalin merely because Stalin's army and Stalin's influence in Asia is far greater Although than what uh, it is. one thing, if this is happening, Stalin is much more likely to feed Mao's industry and give him equipment. So Mao might have more toys than he would in our timeline. So Mao might even be worse. But so actually, he it, might be powerful. But yes, but uh, but yeah, Stalin's forces are yeah, literally the US there. not not fighting the Japanese might mean they might supply the nationals or, more. Yeah, or the United States goes so heavy into China because they don't want another communist mm -hmm. presence because they're afraid of the Soviets that the Chinese Civil War is even worse than it was and it's just like yeah we're talking years worse and we're talking maybe nukes going off who knows I mean, well think crazy. about it because the chinese civil war ended in 49 correct i think yeah. yeah and that was the same year the russians got the bomb or was it yes yeah it was the same year, so, so yeah. if it's a longer war i mean i don't see stalin he, he only had one bomb so of course he wouldn't have given it but if this war goes on long enough well, maybe they, the, yeah, yeah it, I mean, but we don't uh, even know if this, we don't even know if the states has the bomb because it's yeah, different like circumstances. Like, like, why like are they pushing for a nuke? If you know, no, no, I think the bomb still develop because remember the bomb started like with yeah. scientists from around the world. So like the technology was always there. 
And I think it would still have been developed, would it have been developed longer, shorter, who knows? But I think at the end, the Axis still lose. Time frame, let's say I feel latest 1947, they lose now. But if that happens, the casualty rate, I don't even want to know how much higher that could. It's gonna be worse. The economies afterward, if, yeah, the U.S. still becomes the powerhouse because well, it, it, it's more likely a hot war than a cold war, and that's yeah. much more terrifying. As actually, we're currently doing this podcast. I don't know if you were watching the news yesterday with the Ukraine situation. That's terrifying. Yeah, like we're so we're in a similar kind of like NATO, <laughs> Soviet, first, Union, well, yeah. Soviet, uh, Russian Federation moment. The only thing is now. NATO's closer to Russia in this scenario. I mean, in my scenario, NATO's closer to Russia. It could also be, you know what? Maybe if the Russians somehow do manage, as the Germans pull troops out to defend the West from the Allies, Russia still comes in, takes it, but now takes even more land. Doesn't have the little naughty document with Churchill that divides up the uh, the Balkans or that. Well, the one, have... the one thing I would say is Hitler was so i mean because of the actions what they did to the soviets early on they were so terrified of the repercussions of like the rape and pillage and murder that was going to come that i think hitler would sacrifice most of the west just to hold back the soviets like he did yeah but i th- i think what you said is most the most he would have likely, to surrender i think people he would surrenders kill him. He, would, and, he would be killed yeah. immediately or his assassination does go through who knows i think probably hitler is assassinated in this scenario, if he has two fronts opened up like that in 42, 43, I think he is. God, who would take charge? I mean, everyone wants to say Himmler, but Himmler, God, he couldn't have been a leader. He was such an idiot. Uh, Goring? <laughs> Imagine um, Goring on drugs again, doing uh, being the leader. Yeah, that and or... he would surrender immediately. That or the the, 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 the Remok, sorry, I can't pronounce that. Uh, Remok stages a coup and then takes over and becomes like a military junta or uh junta like in the yeah. hearts of iron four well it could be like and, a world war one situation like when ludendorff yeah. basically and you know yeah maybe but yeah so i think then it says so hitler dies doesn't die he still surrenders to the west and not only that if it isn't he tells them get your fucking army on my border right now because the russians won't stop unless there's some allies over there it's basically think, a Henry Turtle Dove novel. Yeah, Actually, so what I think happens, I think that could be the prelude to the hot war you were talking about, was Germans surrendered to the Allies, and then the Allies immediately being like, we need to prevent the Russians from taking any more land than they already have, so we're going to send our troops as fast into the Axis territory, which just surrendered, and occupy as many key places as possible, and then as that's happening, we go take Japan out. Japan still becomes an ally. China probably becomes communist earlier unless the u.s overly supplies the nationalists yeah i mean it's 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 completely feasible that they they do and the national it's not like the nationalists were doomed like there was definitely a possibility the nationalists could have won it's yeah it's a toss it's a coin toss honestly and sorry to chinese audiences if you don't like that kind of talk but i mean it's 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 hypothetical at the end of the day none of this happened it's impossible for any historian to um predict what could have happened because there's so many factors that you cannot account for that only hearts of iron for with all the expansion packs and i (laughs) I know i heresy to say i don't play the game you know everybody in kings and generals and the writing staff plays it and they bug me but yeah uh, I think we read it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think we covered, uh, I think we really did cover it. I think by the end, we, we came to the conclusion that either between 1944 to 1947, the war would end. It still ends. Allies win. It's just either we go straight to a hot war or we go to a uh, more Asian-dominated Russia or we go to a more Russian-dominated Europe. But at the end of the day, Russia pushes Japan like it's not good for Japan either way and then Japan sends in its navy like it would have anyways in these diehard missions near the end of the war maybe they have more ships but they still do the same thing they send them in these kamikaze raids but people people don't want to hear it's like the best answer is what was the best solution for Japan just before world war where world war ii emerges like the 1941 one because if you ask me it starts in 37 
but yeah. the best answer is like Japan would have to like sacrifice its own government, lose face and try to negotiate with China and just stop everything and take the United States negotiations. It'd be like, how do we get relations yeah. back on track, get our resources, and come to an understanding because everything else is just <laughs> such a bad scale news for Japan. Yeah. I mean, even like, and I know people might be saying, oh, well, what if they attacked just the Dutch or just the British in yes. Southeast Asia? That's tricky in its own and how they're going to get around the philippines and do yeah because mm, yeah uh, they would it's... probably put a sanction on that they would they would put a sanction or a blockade in that area like they did on cuba like but i think we it ends can you the imagine same the way. supply like the supply route like the philippines is sitting there and the entire u.s Am like armada is just sitting in front of Waiting. japan basically in the philippines like yeah we don't like this situation could you you're Get not back. moving any transports. All all the territory you took, Dutch East Indies, all the oil tankers are going up and down. Eh, no, they're not moving anymore. We're going to make sure that you're embargoed for life. And Japan's yeah. like, well, uh, then we missed our chance to, to knock uh, out yeah, your entire Pacific the, fleet. <laughs> now the U.S. Are, I mean, yes, there's a maybe the U.S. tries throwing its battleships in this old mentality to well, like. That would be awesome if it happened. <laughs> yeah, but Horrific, I think that if, but awesome. if, if that happens, then the Japanese sink still most of their battleships with their aircraft carriers just in yeah. open battle like they did to the British. It's just a more epic fight, like midway, but with one side battleships, the other side aircraft carriers. Oh, anyway, yeah, that, yeah, that's I think maybe way. I think we uh we went on a little long again, so maybe uh. All right. And yeah. uh, so this is a, like one of the first pilots for this kind of new approach at the podcast. If anyone is curious, I'll be having on other guests soon and other questions, which have been heavily influenced by the Kings and Generals Discord community who helps me with alternate history questions of everything. Like that's 90% of the time. That's all I keep getting from them. I, I, I would love to do real subjects and stuff, but for now, clickbait ones are going to win out so i think actually the next one's probably going to be what happens if pearl harbor is different or doesn't happen and uh the most famous one as you can imagine what happens if japan wins the battle of midway that's coming up next all right thanks everyone bye guys bye